In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Prayer to Christ the King. O Jesus Christ, I acknowledge Thee as universal King. All that has been made has been created for Thee. Exercise all Thy rights over me. I renew my baptismal vows, renouncing Satan, his palms, and his works. And I promise to live as a good Christian. In particular, do I pledge myself to labor to the best of my ability for the triumph of the rights of God and of thy church. Divine heart of Jesus, to thee do I proffer my poor services, laboring that all hearts may acknowledge thy sacred kingship, and that thus the reign of thy peace be established throughout the whole universe. Amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. We are looking at My Catholic Faith, Lesson 109, the Sixth and Ninth Commandments, and we have a diptych, a dual picture here at the top of the lesson. Um, and the caption I'll just read, uh, God punishes the sin of impurity very severely, even here on earth. For that sin he destroyed all living things except those in the ark of Noah during the great deluge. Quote, and God, seeing that the wickedness of men was great, said, I will destroy man. Genesis chapter 6. For the same sin God destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. Quote, and the Lord rained upon Sodom and Gomorrah brimstone and fire. Genesis 19. Today the sites of these cities is covered by the Dead Sea, an ever-present reminder of the evil of impurity. Of course, the two images are, the, I guess, the flood in the time of Noah and the fire and brimstone uh, raining on Sodom and Gomorrah. First question, what are we commanded by the Sixth and Ninth Commandments? By the Sixth, and, by the sixth Commandment, we are commanded to be pure and modest in our outward behavior by the Ninth in thought and in desire. Quote, do you not know that your members are the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you? Glorify God and bear him in your body. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 19 through 20. Another quote. Beloved, I exhort you as strangers and pilgrims to abstain from carnal desires which war against the soul. First Epistle of St. Peter, chapter 2, verse 11. The Sixth and Ninth Commandments are studied together because they both deal with commands about purity. The Sixth Commandments refer to external acts, and the Ninth to willful thoughts and desires. Quote, oh, how beautiful is the chaste generation with glory, for the memory thereof is immortal, because it is known both with God and with men. From Wisdom, chapter 4, verses 1 through 2. Another quote, the body is not for immorality, but for the Lord and the Lord for the body. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 13. God has always shown special love for those whose chastity is outstanding. Consider how he chose that purest of all mortals, the Blessed Virgin, as his mother. Our Lord chose St. John, the Virgin Apostle, as the beloved disciple. It was John who was privileged to lean on his heart at the Last Supper. It was to him that Christ entrusted his mother. What does the Sixth Commandment forbid? The Sixth Commandment forbids all impurity and immodesty in words, looks, and actions, whether alone or with others. To distinguish between the virtues of purity and modesty, let us say that purity regulates the expression of the rights of the married and excludes them outside the married state while modesty is a form of temperance which inclines one to refrain from what may lead to unlawful pleasure. This commandment forbids adultery, which is the unfaithfulness of a married person. It is a duty before God, <coughs> excuse me, it is a duty before God and men for married people to be true to each other. <coughs> Adultery is a great evil which breaks up the harmony of the family and brings punishments in this life and in the next. Adultery is a sin not only against chastity, but also against justice, because it is an injustice towards the spouse of the married person. In the old law, 
the adulterer was punished with death, quote, for God will judge the immoral and adulterers, from Hebrews chapter 13, verse 4. Married people should be most careful in avoiding even the appearance of unfaithfulness. When the spirit of jealousy enters, conjugal happiness goes out. Matrimony is a holy state through which the Almighty God intends the propagation of the race. Actions in accordance with this purpose of matrimony are permitted to the married, but positively forbidden to the unmarried. Fornication is at all times a grave sin. By, quote, the married is meant those Catholics validly married in the Catholic Church. Catholics who marry before a justice of the peace or a non-Catholic minister cannot live together as married people because they are not married either in the eyes of the Church or before God. If those Catholics who are not married before a Catholic priest live together and have children, these are considered illegitimate and are so registered at baptism. All impure and immodest actions, whether committed alone or with others, are forbidden. When impurity is committed deliberately, it is always a mortal sin. The gravity of the sin of immodesty varies according to its nature, the conditions, and the relationship of the persons committing it. A good rule would be to refrain from doing anything you would be ashamed to have your pure mother or chaste daughter know you do. What are the most common occasions of the sin against chastity? The most common occasions are idleness. This is the parent of sin. Man is like the earth. If it is not planted to good seed, weeds grow on it fast. So a person is beset by all kinds of evil temptations unless he has some worthwhile occupation. Thieves break into a house where everybody is paralyzed by idleness. When iron is not used, it begins to rust, and so man who is made to be active stagnates and becomes foul when nothing occupies him all day. Second, bad companions and conversations. Bad companions are the cause for the fall into impurity of numerous young people. We should carefully avoid persons whose conversation is unchaste. Those who take pleasure in listening to improper conversation run a serious risk of falling into sins of impurity. Number three, to free companionship with the other sex. Undue familiarity between opposite sexes inflames the passions just as straw blazes up when brought near the fire. Girls and young women certainly know that if they want to be respected, they must respect themselves and not permit men to be caressing, uh, caressing them at all times. A kiss is a demonstration of affection and therefore is nothing intrinsically wrong with it, but it becomes sinful when used in such a manner as to provoke the passions. This is true also of other demonstrations like embracing, etc. Undue familiarity rubs off the delicacy from girls and the protective and gallant instincts from boys. Number four, immoral books, magazines, and newspapers. You can probably add to that uh, internet or the web. Many are in attractive garb, but enkindle the passions and do harm. Today we have the National Organization for Decent Literature and may be guided by its advice, and of course we no longer have that, so we have to be on our guard ourselves. Number five, indecent shows, pictures, games. Bad shows, whether on the stage or in the films, corrupt more subtly than immoral conversation, because what one sees leaves a stronger impression. Moreover, bad shows represent evil in attractive garb. By attending only shows approved by the National Legion of Decency, we not only avoid bad shows, but compel producers to make good ones. Number six, immoral dances. In itself, dancing is not a reprehensible practice. It is the manner that should be carefully guarded. 
At bad dances, there are often women present who are very immodestly dressed. There is further danger of excessive drinking. A modern curse associated with bad dances is the fad of boys and girls going out alone in cars and driving to roadhouses. This can be a source of danger. You can tell this book is a little dated. <laughs> Number seven, immodesty and excessive luxury in dress. A beautifully dressed girl is pleasing to look at, but, quote, the art of looking nice should not be indulged in to excess. Women whose aim in life is to deck themselves in order to attract the attention of men are putting themselves in the way of unchastity. Do we have any questions or comments? This is a topic fraught with things to comment on, uh, but I'll try to be brief here. Um, the uh, sin of adultery, I think perhaps rightly so, isn't explained clearly enough to children who come to confession uh, having committed sins of impurity and confess that they have committed adultery. Um, and further investigation, I, priests generally will try to point out to them that unless they are married or the person they were sinning with was married, uh, that they have not committed adultery and that there is a distinction between adultery and fornication. Um, and I, though it is a delicate subject to deal with, uh, we try to encourage to be as explicit as possible, but at the same time, uh, we don't want them to become uh, so afraid or ashamed that they refrain from confessing mortal sins. Uh, we would rather have them confess the sins uh, even though the species or the indication of the sin may not be accurate. Um, and of course there are, are occasions especially associated with these sins where it is sometimes better to leave a person in ignorance than it is to instruct them. Uh, but I find very often in the confessional the necessity of defining different things for sinners or giving them the term to explain what they are, the sin, they know it is a sin, they know it is wrong, uh, but they're trying to describe it because they don't have the vocabulary to describe uh, their sin. And so very often the priest is uh, trying to assist them to give them a name, not because he expects them to commit it in the future, but if they do, uh, to have a label they can put on uh, this particular sin. Uh, I don't think I want to get into uh, defining all of that. As I say very often with our children, we don't want to go into too great a depth with these sins. We simply want them to be aware that they must be modest in uh, thought, words, and actions, um, and to regulate these thoughts, and that really any uh, sexual interaction needs to be between a husband and wife who are truly married in the sacrament of matrimony. Um, any impurity before that is displeasing to God. And of course I think another thing to recall is that to make the sin mortal uh, there are certain things that are necessary and I find myself uh, repeating this quite often especially uh, in the confessional, but it's not just young people, even many adults seem to have lost the concept that for a sin to be mortal, uh, it must be seriously wrong. We must know it is seriously wrong and we must have full consent of the will, that is, we want to do it anyway. Um, and if any of these circumstances are wanting or missing, uh, we have not committed a mortal sin and the seriousness of the sin will vary in different degrees. Uh, upon our, the act of our will, uh, the action itself, our uh, recognition of this uh, evil that has been committed. Um, it is not an easy thing in examining our conscience, but if we are in the habit of regularly examining our conscience, it becomes much easier to deal with. Some of the problems I think also with this are that uh, individuals, uh, young individuals will withhold confessing this sin because of shame or whatever, 
um, especially if they think, oh, well, Father, on the other side of the confessional, he will recognize me and I cannot confess this to the priest. Uh, what will he think of me? And so they withhold and perhaps go for years without uh, confessing this sin or that they've made a bad confession. And it is really a terrible tragedy for them to miss out on so many graces, uh, but to live in such a torment of soul uh, during this entire time. And we cannot, I think, really emphasize that the priest is there in the confessional to help us. And he cannot really help us if he doesn't know what the problem is. And uh, just as we go to the doctor and we don't tell the doctor of our symptoms, um, or we leave some very important symptoms out, he's going to misdiagnose us, he's going to give us the wrong medication, he's going to prescribe the wrong treatment, and we're not going to get better. Um, and perhaps the treatment that he prescribes will be counterproductive and actually cause more harm because he doesn't know all of the details. And again, the confessional, there is a necessity of integrity, uh, the times and circumstances, the situation, um, if there's anything unique about it should be revealed, but on the other hand, um, we don't want to make the confessional so oppressive uh, that we are hesitant to confess our sins. And so I'm usually uh, pretty reserved in questioning uh, individuals in these matters of the Sixth and Ninth Commandments unless there is something that they are indicating to that effect. Um, and, um, I'm not in a position to be able to presume or to suggest that uh, he's probably guilty or she's probably guilty of this or that, um, but we must take the individuals at face value of what they say. Um, I have on occasions, and perhaps quite often if I don't hear it from the, con the uh, penitent, ask them if they're truly sorry for their sins. Um, and actually if they would use the formula <laughs> that's prescribed at the end of their confessional, they do say, I am sorry for these sins and whatever, the, all, all the sins of my past life or something to that effect, uh, because the essential element in the sacrament is that of true contrition or true sorrow. Um, and again, as we learned in the Catechism, the sorrow can be uh, it's a perfect contrition or imperfect contrition. Uh, they both are sufficient to receive absolution, uh, but we must, or we should, strive for that perfect contrition. The occasions of sin, um, when I read the, uh, the section there, bad companions and conversations, I can't help but think of St. Augustine, who in his confessions, looking back on the evil of his childhood, comes to the conclusion that by ourselves we can neither be as evil as we possibly can be or as good as we possibly can be. It takes companions to bring out either the worst in us or the best in us. And so the conclusion of St. Augustine is we must choose our companions wisely. If we choose evil companions, they will bring out the worst in us. And if we choose good companions, they will help to bring out the best in us. Um, but at the same time, we cannot put all the burden on our associates because we ourselves must be those good companions. We must be the virtuous one to step up and say, no, this is wrong, we should not do this, or I will not go along with this evil or uh, sinful plot that we are making. Um, okay, and as I mentioned, uh, there's immoral books, magazines, newspapers that I think we our biggest problem, I believe, today, especially for our young people, is the access to the internet on their cell phones, their screens, whatever it may be. Um, and it's not even that they go looking and searching for this, but it pops up all the time. And I shouldn't say all the time, but it pops up unawares very often on these devices and truly to destroy them. Uh, I was listening. Uh, to a talk on, I think it was YouTube, 
and the man giving the talk there was suggesting that uh, erotica is uh, has been with mankind since the beginning and it is not evil in itself and at first it kind of caused me to um, become a little unnerved if you will uh, but then uh, in reflecting upon it yes God we are erotic creatures uh, we have the uh, canticle of canticles which is a love song um, and if you read that it's very uh, graphic it is very physical um, and you can call that erotica if you want and I believe there has to be a sense of eroticism for married couples uh, but this man is making a distinction between this and pornography and pornography is uh, was commercializing uh, erotica if you will um, and pornography is pushing the bounds further and further uh, for some kind of uh, commercial profit and what we lose is not only our money, but our self-respect, our worth, um, our moral integrity is sold uh, to these pornographers who are selling uh, sex. And uh, I would have been quite intrigued about addictions, and I do believe sexual addiction is a real problem in our society. Um, there have been studies of uh, rats and I find uh, perhaps there is a correlation with human beings and the, in the lab many years ago they took rats and they gave them two bottles of water. One bottle of water was straight water, the other was a bottle of water with cocaine. And the rats would invariably take the cocaine and keep consuming the cocaine until they died. And finally another researcher came to the conclusion uh, that the rats were living in a cage. They had no interaction, they had no stimulus uh, for their brain. It was an unnatural situation and they were looking uh, to find some kind of relief or escape from the monotony of their cage. And so they created an enriched environment, had other rats to interact with, uh, they had places for the rat to climb and to play and to dig and tunnel and do all the things that are natural to a rat and they found the rats in that experiment would not touch the cocaine laced water but would only drink the regular water and so to correlate that I think with human beings I think we are in a state where we're isolating people more and more by our screens whatever it may be um, and that leads to an addiction we want the endorphins, uh, the dopamine release in our brains, and we're seeking an addiction. Uh, we're feeding that until we actually destroy ourselves. And it can be alcohol, it can be drugs, and as I say, it can be this pornography uh, that can become all-consuming. But I think even before this starts consuming, there is this separation uh, from society, from people, from interaction, um, it mentioned idleness in here as one of the common occasions of the sin against chastity. Um, well, idleness usually leads to isolation. Um, we need to be out and active. And I uh, have given the example in sermons. Uh, one of the easiest ways to fight the temptation, especially against impurity, is to get active, do something. Uh, sweep, shovel the snow, uh, clean the house, cook, bake, do something to occupy your mind. And I know it goes against our natural impulse. Well, if I'm being tempted to impurity, the real thing to do is to get on my knees and pray and to ask God's intercession, to pray to the Blessed Mother for their intercession. And I say, that sounds good on the surface, but in the heat of the temptation, that's only going to compound the problem. Um, and I give the simple psychological experiment if I say don't think of pink elephants don't think how big the pink elephants are do not think of pink elephants don't think of whether they're male elephants or female elephants don't think if they're pink with polka dots or if they're just solid pink just do not think of pink elephants and after I keep repeating do not think of pink elephants 
I am certain that you have now pictured an image of the pink elephant. And the more I say don't do this, the more we are doing it. Um, and truly that is the situation, especially with impurity. If we are in prayer, Lord, take these impure thoughts away from me. I don't want these impure thoughts. And we keep repeating, either verbally or in our mind, these, this image we're creating that we don't want. We are reinforcing that image. And so my suggestion is, go do something active. Don't be idle. Uh, now is not the time to be on our knees and imploring God, but now is the time to distract our mind to get our body busy doing something else. Now, after you've done this, hopefully the heat of the passion has gone away or it has lessened. When you're no longer in the heat of this temptation, this passion, that is the time to pray. That is the time to humble ourselves and ask God. That is the time when uh, we're not going to be repeating, I don't want to think of the pink elephant, I don't want to think of the pink elephant, but we can calmly and rationally ask God's blessing to preserve us from these uh, thoughts and temptations of impurity. Uh, and of course, there's always the problem, I don't want this, I don't want it, but I keep falling into it, it keeps coming, uh, it's all around me, I can't help but see it, and yes, the impurity is all around you. Uh, we began this lesson with the example of uh, the time of Noah, and suggesting that because of the sins of impurity is why God destroyed this earth. Uh, and I was mentioning to Sister Catherine before the uh, class began that I was not quite aware that it was the sins of impurity. Um, I do know that the Lord destroyed the world because of the immorality, but I did not associate it with impurity per se. Um, I'm and curious perhaps to check that out and to see exactly what different commentators have said on this, uh, but I was fairly certain the sins of Sodom and Gomorrah were sins of impurity and homosexuality, the pursuit of physical pleasure uh, outside of matrimony and without the intention of uh, conceiving and bringing forth children. Uh, that seems evil and obvious enough, I think, from the context, at least the way that I recall it. Uh, but I think perhaps we are living now in a time of Sodom and Gomorrah. Um, and I know I've read previously that um, it wasn't just the sins of impurity of Sodom and Gomorrah, but it was that they rationalized, they tried to justify and to claim that this was natural, which is heaping insult upon insult uh, against God. This is not natural. This is not the way God created things. And I see really an, another reflection of this in the transgender movement. God made a mistake in giving, making me the gender that I am. Um, and so now I must seek to correct God's mistake. He doesn't know what he's doing. He doesn't know me. He doesn't understand me. That is, if they even believe in God. Um, and we, the tragedy is we have, quote, professionals who are trying to... Uh, affirm and confirm that uh, God has made a mistake and they're trying to go along with this and support these individuals in their uh, demonic illusions if you will um, and as I say this lesson is filled with so many things that I could comment on and since there are no questions no comments I think I better say amen so if you would like, we can now end with the act of resignation to the divine will. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, amen. O Lord my God, I now at this moment readily and willingly accept at thy hand whatever kind of death it may please thee to send me, with all its pains, penalties, and sorrows. Benedictio de omnipotentis, Patris, et Filii, et Spiritus Sancti, descendit super vos, et maniat semper. Amen.